Before we get started with today's interview, just a quick reminder, click the thumbs up, make sure you subscribe and ding the bell so that you don't miss any of the great interviews that we have coming up. Now on to today's interview. Welcome back, everybody. I am really excited to present my special guest today, Dr. Kevin Olson. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi, everybody. I'd like to start off by talking about Imagination's book one. Mm -hmm. There's some great selections out of this book on the next list. The last piece in Imagination's book one, which is on the new festivals list, is Morning in Yellowstone. Am I correct to assume that this refers to Yellowstone National Park? Yeah, we're maybe about three hours away from it here in northern Utah where I teach. And so that's always been a a special place. We're lucky out here to have a lot of national parks that are close by. And uh, you can be within a day's drive from something as wild as, you know, Grand Canyon or Zion to something as uh, foresty and and almost otherworldly as Yellowstone. So, yeah, there's certainly some autobiography. I grew up in Salt Lake, so we were never that far from that. And And my brother lives really close to the park there. So, um, yeah, I have a lot of experience up there. Excellent. This is such a beautiful piece. It's so evocative. And I love the fact that it has this really mature sound. One of the things that I struggle with as a person who teaches some adult students is finding something that is easy enough for an adult to approach, yet sounds mature enough. It sounds hard. It's expressive and artistic enough that it holds an adult's interest. And I think you've really knocked it out of the park when when I look at this piece and as I sight read it. Talk to us about some of the things that that about Yellowstone that inspired you to write this piece. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Sam, because that's something that's always been uh, really near and dear to my heart is the adult students that I teach. And, you know, surprisingly, they're most of them are pretty OK with playing pieces with uh, little cartoons on them or little baby titles. But I don't know. I think for me as a teacher, I'm also looking for those types of things that will make them feel um like they're accomplished with with music that speaks their language, that might be something that they um, that they're hoping to be able to play at even a more advanced level that will spur them on. So uh, I'm glad that you also agree that, uh, you know, there's a need for a repertoire that has a little bit more of a mature um, and sophisticated harmonic sound and titles that don't maybe speak down to uh, an older student. This could be a teenager as well. So. Yeah, that was certainly in in the forefront of my mind. Um, I, you know, growing up, I loved playing things by, um, you know, George Shearing or Vince Guaraldi. And this kind of pop uh, kind of sound really spurred me on Henry Mancini and other types of things. So uh, I feel like these kind of pieces, if they can keep a student engaged because they're playing something that sounds maybe um, maybe a little bit new age or pop or something like that, um, then it, then I think it is a win on that. So yeah, this is another one where I think I'm really trying to explore the sounds of added chords, um, putting maybe a second or a sixth along with a triad. So it has just a little bit more of a, of a pop flavor to them. And, but then also trying to write it in a, in a way that there's not a single eighth note in the entire piece. So even though they're playing syncopations, they're, they're, and the beat is moving along really fast because there uh, there are no eighth notes in the piece. Um, they're playing something that might sound a little harder, um, but the notation is easy enough for them to read in, in maybe the first uh, six months of piano study. So this piece has pedal, and this might be one of the first times that a student experiences a piece with overlapping pedal. Mm-hmm. When you introduce that concept to your students, how do you go about talking about that? Yeah, I've always thought that the two most difficult things we have to teach at that maybe late elementary to early intermediate level are connected pedaling, as you mentioned, and then right and left hand balance. I think those are things that really uh, become a, a struggle. There are some great ways that the method books introduce those. But a piece like this, I, I think that it's really important that a student is um, is not playing it straight through but you're talking to the student about the harmonic changes and focusing on those exact moments, the moments where they can hear the the chords change from measure to measure or from beat to beat, and then lifting that pedal at after the moment of the change. And of course, as we all know, as teachers, that's so difficult. You're playing the note, then you're pedaling, right? I've actually had to literally get on the floor and move a student's foot to actually help some students that are less than maybe uh, a nimble with that kind of choreography. But um, 
it really uh, it, it allows the student, I think, to to focus in on uh, what I think is a real key in this piece, which is the harmonic rhythm. To think about where those chords are really changing, and then maybe just isolating the the chords by themselves and just going from measure to measure, chord to chord. I think a lot of times reductive um, analysis can really help. In other words, getting rid of some of the extra notes and just looking at the structural harmonics uh, points there and having the students listen closely to where the pedal is changing. Um, I will say, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, Sam, it's a marathon and not a sprint with that. It, it really is something that takes a lot of time. Like I say, I just know when I've got a student at that level, that's gonna be a challenge. And then the right and left hand balance, I think is gonna be uh, an equal uh, challenge. So uh, that's also, I think, a, a, a part of this piece that uh, is going to be important is for students to recognize what they need to bring out in a melody and how to, to make uh, a little bit more of a background uh, uh, harmonic sound. And uh, they might get it in this piece, they might not, but I like the fact that a piece like this might at least get that discussion started. Those are some really great tips for both teachers and students. What other things would you like a student to focus on and think about as they are performing the morning in Yellowstone? Yeah, I mean, I think this is also an opportunity for students to think about phrase shaping and how phrases work. Uh, one advice that I often give to young composers, because we as pianists maybe don't prioritize it like other instruments, but uh, really uh, as composers, I think we have to think about the, the structural instructions that we give to our students through um, uh, phrases. And so uh, even though we as pianists are like, eh, everything's legato unless we say it's not, well, I think phrases also um, uh, tell a different story to a performer, which is how am I supposed to construct this musical idea? What measure does, what phrase does this measure belong to? Is it the first of a new phrase or is it the last of a previous phrase? So I think really being focused in on uh, the phrase markings and thinking about where the piece tends to want to feel it needs to breathe, I think is a really important part of this piece. Um, I think even within a phrase, where is maybe the high point, uh, a structural place you want to, to lead to? The composer is not gonna write every single little dynamic marking for every student because we want the student to have a sense of freedom and expression. We'll give some of the big dynamic markings here, but I hope students and teachers realize that there's some flexibility between that and that you as a student and a teacher can get excited about thinking, where should we kind of lead this moment to? Are we going somewhere? Are we coming from somewhere? If I've written four Fs in a row, are all those Fs gonna be the same or do they have a different function? Even where something is placed within a, a, a measure, uh, a certain beat, uh, beat one might have a different level of importance than beat four, for example. So this is the fun part of piano. If it was just following instructions, I probably would be in a different career because I don't like people telling me everything I need to do. I like to have a sense that I'm, I get to have a little bit of control. So uh, I like to tell my students that too, that uh, we're getting basic instructions from people like Beethoven or Grieg or Rachmaninoff. But between those places, uh, we get to kind of figure out how to make it um, speak that feels authentic to ourselves as well. So even at this early stage, I think there could be some, some nuance that you work on with students. Those are just awesome suggestions. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today, Kevin. Kevin Olson's book is Imaginations Book One. You can find it at all of the awesome music retailers near you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, everybody.